pleasure to be before you once more on this Lord's Day. If you would be turning over to the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. There it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. As we were finishing up our class on Wednesday night in Galatians, I, as it often happens, I just got to thinking about this verse. And it's an interesting verse in that it, it shows us what we should glory in. Paul says, but God forbid that I should glory. In fact, we just sang, shouldn't boast except in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that is, in fact, what Paul here writes. What we should glory in is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not just the wooden structure that he was nailed to. That's not necessarily what it's talking about we should glory in. But everything it represents. What did it represent when Jesus was nailed to the cross? Well, it brought about man's salvation from his sins. And it took the very Son of God to bring that about. Now, the other side to this is, he's not saying that we shouldn't be proud or we shouldn't have glory in the different things in this life, but it's bringing the proper amount of perspective in comparison to the two. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed being in powerlifting whenever I was competing in high school and college, especially college, because I'd bulked up to where I was decently competitive and in the collegiate world. Uh, I could lift a bunch of weight and I would win, uh, win awards. I remember that I had gotten second place at, or I get no, it was fifth place at University of Texas. And I got this little glass jar that has the University of Texas logo inscribed on it. And I was very proud of that, still am to some extent. He's not saying we shouldn't have any glory and that sort of thing. But when you can make the comparison, the best thing that we, or the only thing we really need to have true glory in is our salvation and the access that we have to it. If you could consider 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, he makes this exact point. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. So no doubt Paul was a very learned man, but he didn't come to them, look at my Ph.D., I'm a master tit maker. Well, verse 2 says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. So not only is he showing himself to be humble, but the focus on the reason he was there was not to boast about himself, to show, look what I, Paul, have done, but rather to preach the gospel to them. That was the focus. Verse 3, And I was with you in weakness, and in fear, and in much trembling. So he had empathy with them. Verse 4, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So we see the focus. We see the focus. Again, having glory in the correct things, and that is the death of our Savior, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse 14 of Galatians 6, By whom the world is crucified unto me. We know in Romans chapter 6, the first six verses, that this is what should be happening to sin. It's dead to us. 
When we were buried in the watery grave of baptism, our old man was put to death. Along with it, all those old habits, all those old sins. Romans 6, verse 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So when one becomes a Christian, this is the pact they're making with God. I have put to death my old manner of conduct, and I, once rising out of those watery grave of baptism, I am a new creature. We're promised to become a new creature at that point. We're saved to sin no more. And then the latter part of verse 14, And I unto the world. So Paul was crucified unto the world. Part of putting to death the old manner of conduct is the fact that the world has lost one of its own. When I became a Christian, I gave up all the different things that enticed me that the world had to offer. All the different sins that were involved with that. So in a sense, the world, to me, was crucified, but also I was crucified to the world. I'm not a member of the world anymore from that standpoint, from a spiritual sense. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. If you flip back a few pages, Paul again there says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's a new life. It's a new way of doing things. That is the Christian life. The Christian walk. In verse 14, Paul very plainly outlines what our goal should be, what our glorying should be, which again is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that the old world to us is crucified to us and we are even put to death by the world from a spiritual sense. Again, we're raised from those waters to sin no more. We're expected to live differently, to think differently, to be different. So in that sense, we're, we're dead twice. Now this manner of life is not for everyone. Though God does want all to be saved, the vast majority of people don't care about spiritual things. And unfortunately, that will not change. That doesn't change our job as Christians to preach the word, to live the word, to make it our conversation in this life, to present God's word in action, to be the good example before others. But we can't change the hearts if they're not willing to change themselves. Now after a time, we're going to have to know this. Just in dealing with people, there's folks that don't care anything about spiritual matters. If you back up a few verses, when, while, the, while Paul is making his closing arguments and closing sentiments, he's referencing here the Jews of his day. And they're glorying in the law of Moses well at this time what had happened to the law of Moses it was nailed to the cross Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 though it was no longer in effect from a, a religious standpoint these people were still living under that law as if it were in effect they were glorying in the law of Moses and they were glorying particularly in the circumcision act that they had pushed on others. But Paul very plainly points out that that's a false glory. We need to be glorying under the law of Christ. So this afternoon, if you are not a Christian, yet you would like to become one, why not take the time to do so? If you're already a Christian, but yet have not been living as one, why not take this time to be restored as a proper or with a proper relationship with your creator. So the next few moments as together we stand and sing, why not?
render obedience to the gospel of Christ, or put away the sin that has beset you. And now together as we stand and sing.